Good morning, everyone. Unmasked. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable, dear God, in your sight. I'm happy to be with you this day on a, for another of our sermon conversations that we've recorded from St. James. Today, as we sit here, they will take up their ministries for the very first time. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, I know that they will hear our support as they move forward in a special prayer for them. So please pray with me. Gracious God, we offer a special prayer for deacons Nancy, Catherine, and Daniel. May they faithfully represent Christ and the church, particularly as servants of those who need, and to assist bishops and priests in the proclamation of the gospel and the administration of the sacraments. We are thinking of you and praying for you this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now to our sermon conversation. In addition to my particular way, a certain scripture passage has influenced their lives. Well, some days ago, this commentator reflected on this. It is a beautiful and challenging experiment we have today, some 2,000 years after Jesus walked the earth, in prayerfully representing the words we hear through scripture, through a contemporary lens, and in doing so, according to where we hear the Spirit, being accurate and faithful to the intended meaning. This is beautiful, and it is also challenging. At the close of his reflection, he posed the following question. Would our understanding of Jesus and Jesus' teachings and our understanding of what God's word in general benefit from trying this practice out ourselves? So I decided that's what we would do this morning. And since I'm preaching, I could decide that. <laughs> so let's try a walk through our second reading, uh, the letter, the epistle of James. Just a quick note. The letter is attributed to James, the just, the brother of Jesus. But the style of the Greek language and the text makes it unlikely that this is actually so. The letter is full of exhortations and maybe even commands and things we should do and not do. But I want to focus on the basic questions in it. Draw near to God, as we sang this morning. Draw near to God, and God will draw near to you. The subtext in today's language, I think, is that being God's friend, being God's friend is not totally or simply rushing around getting the work done for Jesus. It is more holistic, we would say, today, a matter of root and core from where these works emerge. Now these days, I don't know about you, uh, I know some of you because I've heard from you, we hear an awful lot about CORE, C-O-R-E, in the world. Worlds, uh, the words like building your abdomen muscles, <laughs> right? <laughs> Paying attention to your core. Lift from the core or you may strain your back. Breathing into the core. I hear that in yoga, I hear it in Kijong, my class. This is an exercise for a happy and healthy life. 
And you may hear it in Tai Chi. I don't know. I haven't tried it. Do you hear about core in Tai Chi? No? Okay. Balance. Balance. All right. Balance, that's fine. It goes with the idea. It's the center of your body that is the focus and where your physical strength resides. The ask from James, however, this week is about the wisdom informing your work and the action in the world coming from your core in a different sense, not your physical strength, but from God. So let's consider that together. Our modern word, core, C-O-R-E, is derived from the French word, core, C-O-R, or cur, C-O-E-U-R, meaning heart, heart. And etymologically speaking, <laughs> courage, <coughs> courage comes from that same place. So discernment, finding God's way, and living our lives out of that wisdom in our heart, our core, comes from a different kind of exercise. A different kind of exercise. Discernment, listening for God's way, begins with courage. Courage to listen at the very core of your heart for the whisper, the whisper of God. Listen in the quiet over time for a long time. Listen for God's solutions, God's plans for you, God's guidance, God's comment on your choices, God's still small voice in your heart. What drives the choices we make? What drives them? Some of the ideas are listed in the letter of James. Is it possible in me is in there? Or selfishness is in there? Or are we involved unduly in conflicts and disputes? Or have we ever co coveted something we didn't have? These actions show listening in the secular sense, the physical, the earthly, if you will. The whisper of God, God's wisdom heard in our hearts is more pure as James reminds us, peaceable, gentle, full of mercy and good fruits. So how do we do that? Our lives are busy, aren't they? We have families, we have work, we come to church, we volunteer in church, we do all manner of other things. So where do we find that still quiet time I've heard it all, and maybe you have too. Some people do it in the shower. That's the place. They are standing in the shower, and they are listening to God as the water washes over them. Someone told me that this very week. That is when that person hears God's voice. Some people do it on awakening. First thing in the morning. Open your eyes and think about the day and where God is going to be in it for you in your life. What you're looking for, hoping for, what can you contribute from your gifts that God gave you? Some people do it at night. The very last thing as they are reviewing how the day went and where the light of God came to them in their choices or their interactions. There are many other ways that you can find time to hear this whisper and find that peace which we, in our tradition, the Episcopal Anglican expression of the Christian faith, say, 
most every Sunday. The peace that passes all understanding. We know it when we feel it. Good works done with the gentleness of wisdom. Now, moving on, there are times when one wonders why certain lections or readings are put together on a certain Sunday, because they just seem kind of out of, out of kilter. But I like to say that I don't think so this morning. Today is not one of those days. Clearly, Jesus is having a difficult time teaching the disciples about his temporary place in the world and what the final days of his earthly life will be and what beyond he will leave behind. He had taken them away from the crowds to explain that, to be in silence, if you will, so they could really hear him. But they did not understand. They knew they were attracted to Jesus, attracted enough to leave the work they'd done before and follow him, but they had not yet been given the courage, I don't think, to listen with a heart and to know that Jesus was really the Son of God. When they came to Capernaum, Jesus found out that his disciples continued to engage in disputes and conflicts and arguments about which one of them was the greatest. Which was the greatest? Truly, they did not get it. So Jesus tried again. Whoever wants to be first shall be last and the servant of all. The person of the lowest status in the house at that time was a child. A child in Jesus' time. That child was lifted up and welcomed and wrapped in the arms of Jesus, covered, covered in love, approved of. All would be welcomed is the message. Jesus came to turn, has made sure that we are forgiven from everything once and for all. False choices, misunderstanding, missteps through God's mercy. If we only seek repentance, God, if you will, has created a river that flows and flows and flows, full of grace and peace. You can depend on it. Now flash forward to us. Jesus actually calls all of these gifts so that we may go forth and do the works we do, being prompted by the wisdom of God. And for that, as I always say, I say thanks be to God.